each semester. And so this system looks at a faculty member and populates it with every class that faculty member is teaching. Then it says, then it says, if a faculty member identify uh, a student um, in three indicated areas, either behavioral, academic, or attendance, and there are issues or barriers in any of those three areas, within the first three to six weeks of the semester, the faculty trigger the alert. The alert is automated in terms of going straight to the student immediately. And at the same time, it also sends an alert to our academic advisor. Everything is simultaneous, ins instantly. And the advisor outreach to the student. But this semester, we've built in another mechanism using the CRIM system, the Hobson system, where in addition to the automated email that goes to the student, we're using Hobson's Retain to send another email to the student to say, um, you have an alert, and you need to contact your advisor so that we could create an intervention plan for you. If there are barriers, we can help you remove it. So you could stay in the class, do well in the class, and in this way, we help our persistence of retention rate. And I'm going to show you the data. He had a question. Somebody had a question? Yes. Yes, sir. Was great. When you mentioned, like, for example, that the last step is like closing that loop. Yes. What really determines that the loop is closed? Just right. For right. example, would that only be that the student went to see the person he she needed to see or was advised to see, or proof or actual proof, I would say? <laughs> That, that a student specifically understood the concept he she was having issue with? Well, no, it's a good question. And, and to answer your question is, how do we know the loop is closed? Because based on, on the, the alert that is triggered by that faculty member, let's be concrete. Let's say a faculty member triggers an alert because little Johnny missed three quizzes in the first three weeks of the semester, right? So the advisor called little Johnny in and says, look, the faculty member is saying you missed three quizzes, this could affect your final grade. What are the issues? Let's discuss it, create an intervention plan, and let's, let's, let's get you back on track. That conversation takes place through an advisement appointment or multiple follow-up advisement appointments, right? So the problem is, is resolved, and then the advisor says to the faculty member, ma'am, sir, We've resolved the issue. Here is a, here is a, a, a narrative on, on the issue and how we've resolved it. So the faculty member in this system could look at how it's being evolved in terms of the outreach. And that's how the faculty member knows that it's closed. But you raise a good point. It's not enough to close the loop. We need to look at the grades at the end of the semester and say to ourselves, what really happened to that student? And you'll see the data. You'll see the data because we have those metrics. We have those metrics. So again, the system is, is really friendly. So this is how the system works. Step one, within the first three to four weeks, and why we chose the first three to four weeks? Guys, that's the, the census data, right? That's when the faculty member collects the attendance, right? and provides the college with the attendance for the first three to four weeks. So it makes sense. If little Johnny is not coming to class first three to four weeks, you want to know that, and you want to address the issue. Let me, let me add something here. Yeah. At, at Lehman, our faculty are not required to take attendance. There is no attendance requirement. At some schools, there is a re an attendance requirement. Faculty are only required to take attendance up and through the first four weeks of class. That's because of federal financial aid purposes, right? It's, it's different at every place, but in our place, they're not required to. If, if a faculty member has an attendance policy, he or she is asked, is encouraged strongly to put it in the syllabus so that students know that, that it is a part of the evaluation metric. You know, some, some faculty's approach is Look, I'm here. If you come, you come. If you don't, you come. It's, it's on you. 
you're a grown up and that's up to you. We have some faculty members who have that attitude. Everywhere. Right? Everywhere, right? We have other faculty members who say, your attendance is important, I'm going to track it, and if you don't come, if you miss X number of days, X number of classes, or you're late, it's going to cost you academically. So we have that mix. Right. So within the first three to four weeks, and by the way, the faculty that we're currently working with, um, they've given us their full attention. There's buy-in. And you're going to see the numbers. We're going to run the metrics for you, and you'll get a full picture of what the metrics are saying. But we have total buy-in from these faculty members. And let, let me just skip this piece. I mean, you can always read it in your, in your packet. Um, so what are the three alerted areas? These are the three, as I mentioned earlier, academic, attendance, and behavioral. So if, for example, little Johnny came unprepared for class, an alert will be triggered for you know, unpreparedness, that will go to the advisor. Remember, there's this wonderful collaboration between the faculty who's triggering the alert and the academic advisor. And literally, they, they communicate via this tool. This, or this stair too. And I've got to share with you, here's some of the things that have happened. They've gotten out of their offices and they've walked over to my advisors and they've beginning to talk with my advisors and there's this incredible synergy that goes on that has never happened before. So we, we're attributing the tool to this incredible synergy, which, which we're liking. All right, so these are you know, some of the things that, that we could look at. Let, let's talk about what the alert looks like. So look, the whole intent of this tool is not to stigmatize the student, right? Little Johnny is doing poorly. You don't want to be a dead part. The idea is if little Johnny has barriers or is doing poorly, we've got to remove those barriers, but in a respectful way. Our emails are written from a respectful perspective. It's generic. It doesn't interfere with purple. And we've got to be careful what goes on that system. Anything that goes on our system does not interfere with purple, or hippo for that matter, right? So again, we're very careful in the way we craft emails and things like that. So again, this is all in your packet. If you want to implement this system, again, we've given you enough of information that you could use as, as a tool um, for, for your implementation. So now, we talked about what are some of the methods to remove the barriers that students might, might be having uh, in terms of, um, in terms of, of um, you know, of, of removing these barriers? So as I mentioned before, we offer academic advising. And as the Vice President alluded to, we use an intentional, intrusive advisement model. Okay, uh, and the model is, is a social integration model uh, by Vin, Dr. Vincent Tinto. So, for example, a student has a problem, they come into our advisor, the advisors give the student an undependent, they're on the, uh, uh, you know, uh, attention, undivided attention, and they work with that student to remove the barrier. For example, if a student comes in and says, you know, I'm doing poorly, I can't go to the tutoring center or, or to the learning center because I have to work, then what we do is we, we help the student to understand that their weekend, uh, the learning center or the tutoring center is also open on the weekend, and let's help you map how you could, you could go to the center. Let's say there's a, a child care issue. How many of your students have child care issues? And it conflicts with, your class, with the class uh, schedule, right? We have a child care center on, on the campus. And so we help the student to understand, listen, bring your child, take the child to, to child care. You don't have to, to, to miss tutoring or miss this class. Uh, there are resources here. So we help them to understand how they link the resources to their lives to remove some of these barriers. And so that's how we do in, in terms of advising. We have counseling. Let's say the student is experiencing some egregious issue, and perhaps it's a mental issue, and, and, and it's clinical. We have 
a licensed counselor on staff that can help that student. And by the way, the academic advisor works closely with the counselor through a referral system. We don't give a paper to a student that says, oh, you have a clinical problem? Go see um, Ms. Ms. Smith over in the counseling center. We walk them over. We walk them over. Don't pick up the phone and make a call. Yeah, little Johnny is coming over. You're not helping to remove barriers from that student. Take the student over. This is a very serious issue, and it should be handled in a serious manner. It takes five minutes or two minutes out of your time extra to walk the student. But we know we're helping to remove these barriers. Right? Um, other support services. We have a ton of students that comes in in their, in their second semester and they want to be part of the nursing program. But the slots in the nursing program are limited. So you've got 2,000 students who want to get into 90 slots. My God, you know that's not going to happen. But here's where the anxiety comes in. When they don't make it in, we're not worried about those who get in. We'll give them the resources to get in. For example, I'm currently running what's called the NSC Pre-Nursing Preparation Workshop. We pay for a faculty member to come in and offer a 10-week workshop to help those students pass the test and get into the nursing program. I'm not concerned about them. I'm concerned about the 1,500 who doesn't get it. What happened to their life? Many of them may drop out because their dream is shattered. We're not there to shadow people's dreams. We're there to help them through these dreams, right? And so what do we do? We counsel them, we work with them, and help to show them that if you can't get into nursing, perhaps you could do other classes in the health sciences, right? There are multiple other things. And so we help, help them to, to sort of understand that, that there are other avenues. And the vice president alluded to this, that there are multiple pathways they can take. In addition to that, the career advising, right? Many students come in undeclared, and we find that if we help students to declare a major, the journey becomes easy. Listen, when you get up in the morning, if you don't see the end, the journey becomes difficult, right? If you get up in the morning and you don't know where you're going, how are you going to dress for that part, right? Where are you going? What are you doing? So we help them in that process. That's Let's look at some more things. Uh, protocol. It's not enough when you're dealing with students to say, um, yeah, take this paper and go over to the center. There must be follow-up. We have a tutoring log. If we send a student over to the learning center, it could be two or three blocks away because our campus is spread out and we have multiple buildings. The question is, you send a student over, how do you know the student is going to the tutoring center? We have a tutoring log. And by the way, the tutoring log is built into this early warning system. A faculty member could follow up with the tutoring center to see if the student did come over. So we have those built-in mechanisms. Um, how do we message ourselves to students? It must be asset-based. We must be respectful. You know, students are coming and knocking on our doors with a bag on their shoulder. You show me one student who comes into a college without a bag on their shoulder. They all have bags, right? And they knock on that door and they say, could you help me? I really want to have a future just like you do. And the only way we could do that is if we speak to them with respect, we show that they come forth. And it's about results. And that's the way we run our shop in the software year program. Our advising, we have multiple forms. We have goal setting forms at the beginning of the semester and students complete an end of the year reflection. Did you meet your goals? If you didn't, what do we need to help you in the second semester so that you could continue your goal? So it's, a, it's not only about having a process. Process must have protocols, it must have messaging, and then you must have the documentation to help you on this journey. We have that. Now, let, let's look at the data. Let's look at the data. And I've got to quickly, because I'm just told I only have five minutes. So we pilot the early warning system in the fall of 2014. 52 of 59 faculty members, um, 59 RSVP that they wanted to be part of the process. Uh, 52 actually showed up. That's an 88 response. 88% response rate, which is not bad, right? 
for an initial roll off, we had 143 alerts triggered. And there were 137 unique students that uh, those alerts were triggered on. Let's see what happened in the following semester. It went from 52 to 68, right? And look what happened. It went from 143 to 172. And, and that was a 19% increase over here with 167 unique from 137. Remember, this is the first time we're doing it, first year. And by the way, we hadn't built an infrastructure that would, that would accommodate all the students in the college. Listen, when you're working with something new, you've got to pilot it first, you've got to see how it works, and if it's successful, then you scale it up. I mean, that's smart, uh, just smart process, because money's involved, sir. Let me add something here. I think one of the keys to engaging our faculty in this process, because this is voluntary, we, this is not a mandatory participation uh, for our faculty. So basically, <clears throat> we're selling the process. We're saying, if, you, if we work together, we can help your students in your classes, in your majors, in your programs succeed. This is a new approach for us. What we, what we, what we did was create a user-friendly process. Because you know, if you ask anyone, especially a faculty member who feels they're teaching too many courses because the workload is too much, if, if you create a process with 100 forms and this, that, and the other thing, it's not going to happen. So the, the, what we ask faculty to complete is very brief and concise. They go into the system, click on it, their roster appears, everybody registered in their class, and they go through that list easily, quickly, and if it's Jim or Juan or Maria that's having a problem, it's click, 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 boom, done. You don't, we don't need narrative, you don't have to write narrative, you just click, and you can do that very quickly. And I think you don't want to create a system that is too onerous. People feel like, I'm too busy. You know, I've got to read papers, I've got lab work to do, I'm not going to mess around with this. Now, thank you, sir. Now, we, we looked at the faculty triggering these alerts, right? So how do you measure what, what you did? How do you measure it? Well, look at the grades. Look at the grades. Now, in the fall, remember, this was the initial rollout. I want you to remember this statistic. 23% failed. 23% failed after the first semester. Failed. Right? So you might say, wait, let me rethink this. Still got a higher. Let's look at what happened in spring. 13%. That was a 10% differential on the downward side. Clearly, this system is working. But let's backtrack for a second. Let's do the math here. This is how many passed. Now, look, I'm not going to stand here and lie to you. Yeah, we only had about 3% that had A's. But these were at-risk students to begin with. We knew they weren't going to get A's. But we wanted them to at least pass. So let's do the math. 3 and 6 is 9, and 11 is 20, and 6 is 26 pass, 26% pass, 23% fail, and the withdrawal rate. Let's go back. I mean, let's go forward. 2 and 16 is 18, and 18 is 36, and uh, 36 and 12 is uh, what? 58? 58. 58. Right? So 26 as opposed to 58, this is how many passed. And remember, the failure rate went down. So this is what we're showing in terms of data after the first year. Let me say something here about unofficial withdrawals and withdrawals. In our system, if you walk away from a course, and I'm sure everybody's the same way, if you just walk away from a course, you're going to get a failing grade, right? Uh, at WU, our system uses a WU, that means you stopped attending. That's a failing grade. Bad. An official withdrawal is not desirable either. But sometimes when the ship is leaking, you have a big hole in the bottom of the ship, and you can't throw, get the water out of the ship fast enough, sometimes the best advice to a student is get off the ship. 
don't walk away, but officially withdraw. Not good for your financial aid, but it's not a failing grade. So 